how they get the facts right. Um, so we're going to hear a little more of this today, I think. Um, so I would slow things down a little more. Emily. So I wanted to um, recommend a new online journal, which is, a, a, I think, a, a refashioning of a former print journal. It's the uh, Journal of Humanistic Mathematics. Uh, edited in California. And I'm now on the editorial board. It's really quite an interesting journal. And um, much of it is both philosophical and, and there's a real strong interest in this journal in mathematics education. So my, my one publication that really has to do explicitly with math education is in there. So I recommend it to you. Uh, also, Founded the Journal of Mathematical Intelligencer, which always has a wide variety of uh, topics and great illustrations. <clears throat> uh, for the past, in a way, for the past decade, more intensively for the past two years, I have been sitting on, on the number theory seminars of Winnie Lee, who is uh, one of our number theorists at Penn State. She divides her time between Penn State and uh, Taiwan, where she runs a mathematics institute. And uh, speaking of blackboards, I have a really great picture of her standing at the end of this enormous blackboard, which she is just covered with what she's lecturing on. She lectures without notes, very fast, and she just covers the whole back blackboard. And I took that picture and I thought, you know that there are not that many poems dedicated to great teachers. Here is a great teacher. I'm going to write an ode. So I wrote, I wrote an ode to Winnie Lee's uh, amazing ability to teach number theory. And it is in the latest issue of the Mathematical Intelligence. <laughs> so, uh, because I don't really like doing PowerPoint presentations, I'm going to read you part of the paper, which all of you at this point should have a copy of. Because this is a conference where there are a lot of historians of mathematics, I would be happy for any advice about uh, things to read or sources about 19th century mathematics, because um, I am trying to get a handle on some things, I, you know, not the whole, you know, just some isolated threads that <clears throat> take us through the 19th century from relatively simple beginnings to the, the proof that I am trying to understand that would be wild proof of Fairmont's last year. Uh, so, any advice would be happily accepted. I mostly spend my time in the 17th century. So any advice about how to navigate the 19th century would be happy to accept. Some of what I say here is a little bit hypothetical. So I mean that the, the history part. I've been trying to do for the past couple of years when I've been working on this uh, uh, number theory set of, of case studies is to get a handle on the nature of ampliative reasoning in mathematics. Um, I wrote a book on Descartes and I tried to show in that book that his claims to have carried out certain kinds of reductions only work because he is smuggling some things in the back door. 
um, and that his, his claims are inflated. I try to show that in some detail. Uh, I've, I've tried now about two or three different approaches to this topic as, as I've been trying to explain the nature of the ampliative reasoning. And it has to do with my general sense that, I'm not really a Platonist, but I really think that the fact that mathematics has its own objects, those objects are individuated in the way in which mathematical objects are individuated, that they are heterogeneous, that there are truly very different kinds of objects in mathematics. And that um, when you bring one mathematical area into the service of another mathematical area for the purpose of solving problems, you get a kind of superposition which creates certain kinds of highly structured ambiguities. Uh, I've also been thinking quite a bit about what happens when you treat something in mathematics as the subject term and when you make it ghostly and have it play the role of a, a predicate term. And I've also been thinking about what's different between a logic of uh, propositions and a logic of terms. I mentioned briefly Aristotle's syllogistic at the beginning of this paper as an example of the expressive powers of a logic of terms that are lost in a logic of propositions. This is a commonplace. Uh, so establishing the relation between S and P by a middle term, which also the form of the syllogism ensures the relevance of the uh, uh, the components of the syllogism to each other. There are lots of other ways in which terms can be set in rational relationship to each other. One of my favorites is uh, ex exemplified by Kassirer in his book Substance and Function, where he says, oh yes, let's look back to the way in which the Greeks brought the, the Greeks studied these uh, geometrical forms, and then Descartes puts them in systematic relationship to each other by uh, analytic geometry. This is a really interesting way in which terms, mathematical things, can be set into systematic relation with each other. And that is something that can be formalized, but it is... Uh, you know, it's a different kind of formalization. The other thing is that um, in, a, in a different paper, I talk about uh, the formalization of number theory. I, I'm, I'm just referring for the purposes of right now to the formalization in the book by Anderton. Uh, but what I want to point out is that you have a claim about the realm of numbers. Your, your pen and, is invisible. Oh, I'm sorry. They're looking for a new one. Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I can see it up here, but nobody else can. <laughs> no. uh, so what you have is, uh, you have a hierarchy of well-formed property. <coughs> the arithmetic hierarchy and then the analytic hierarchy. and You have associated with it a hierarchy of sets. I think they should be distinguished. Then you have, uh, by implication, a hierarchy of sets of integers of greater and greater complexity, but I think that they need to be distinguished and that their relations should be thought through carefully um, and not taken for granted. So this is some of the, in other words, um. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to tell you what I put up there. That's whoops. That's numbers and that's sets. Well, exactly. You felt that it would recharge the card. That's propositions and terms. Okay. 
So I guess I should sit, maybe. And uh, read a paper. It's so old-fashioned. I'm certainly not going to get past. Uh, I'm not going to get through this whole paper, but I'd like to read you the first couple sections. Let me stand up. You guys in the back, you can stand up if you want. <laughs> if we're going to talk about mathematics and values, we should first invoke the 17th century rationalists. Descartes spoke of the light of reason and used his method, the order of reasons, to secure the truths of mathematics in meditation 4, just after he secured the truth of the existence of God in meditation 3. Leibniz affirmed by his principle of sufficient reason that all of reality, including the possibles to frame the actual and help to lend meaning, is thoroughly intelligible. God chooses this created world as the best of all possible worlds in virtue of our progress towards greater and greater perfection, harmony, and organization. At the end of his essay on the ultimate origination of things, he writes, and thus already many substances have arrived at greater perfection. <clears throat> Although given the infinite disability of the continuum, there are always other parts asleep in the abyss of things, yet to be aroused, to be advanced to better and greater stages, as one might say, to better cultivation. Thus progress never comes to a conclusion. Spinoza perhaps most strongly unifies the ethical and the metaphysical import of intelligibility in parts four and five of his ethics. When we are in bondage, our ideas are extremely our ideas are externally caused. We react randomly and our activity is reduced. We merely know that. When we are free, however, we affirm our ideas because of reasons, which explicate the inner meaning or intelligibility of thought, and our activity is enhanced. We understand why. The true north of Spinoza's philosophical compass is the irreducible seriousness and significance of existence and reason is the final arbiter of ethical judgment. Peter Roquette, does anybody here know Peter Roquette? No, I didn't talk about that. Can I present the mic of the king? I think it's too, too late, so I think. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Roquette makes a rather Spinozan observation at the beginning of his interesting long essay, What is Reciprocity? on the evolution of the field theory in the 20th century, when he remarks, the mere proof of the validity of the theorem is not in general satisfactory to mathematicians. We also want to know why the theorem is true. We strive to gain a better understanding of the situation than was possible for previous generations. Sometimes the result seems to be better understood if it's generalized, or if it's looked at from a different point of view, or if it's embedded into a general theory which opens analogies to other fields of mathematics. And Kaizuya, Kaizuya Kato, does anybody know him? John. <laughs> <coughs> Sounds quite like Nietzsche and at the beginning of his co-authored textbook, Number Theory One. It, there's Number Theory One, Two, Three, I think perhaps Four, where he writes, Fermat, who was the founder of modern number theory, noticed the depths of the world of numbers. Recently, a deeper part of number theory has been found to be tied up with a deeper part of theoretical physics, as if it makes a harmony with the philosophy of Pythagoras that everything is a number. We think that the reason for the depth of the world of number that fascinated Pythagoras, Fermat, and many others is that it is a reflection of the depth of the universe. As number theory has developed, during the 350 years since Fermat's era, we had discovered the enormous depth of the world of numbers. The 19th century philosopher, first, my lamented colleague, Peter Lipton, who I wanted to send three or four students to go study with, but they couldn't, since he disappeared 10 years ago. My celebrated colleague, Car Carlo Cellucci, and my younger colleagues, Daniel Campos, Emiliano Politi, David Agler, Dirk Schlimm, and Amanda Hicks have over the years helped me understand the amplitude of nature of explanation more deeply and to see the various ways in which it does and does not lend itself to formalization. Recently, I've insisted on the importance of number theory vis-a-vis, -vis, sorry, 
Recently, I've ins insisted on the importance of problem reduction vis-a-vis -vis theory reduction. But I think the importance of problem reduction, its possibility and its usefulness, itself requires a better philosophical account than I have yet offered. Thus, I turn to the terms of discussion that I've been having with these people just mentioned. Problem reduction as it has existed historically is clearly amply important and thus is not captured by the notion of theory reduction as usually codified. Hence my own repeated critique of the mid-20th century model of theory reduction. Likewise, explanation, understood as inherently ampliative, is not captured by Hamble's deductive nomological model of explanation. What I would like to say clearly in this paper is that problem reduction typically takes place in mathematics in order to explain patterns that are evident but puzzling. That is, puzzling patterns that occur in mathematics ask for explanation in order to become meaningful. If we ask why they occur in the first place, the answers help us to see why problem reduction increases meaningfulness. Insofar as celebrated mathematical problems like Fermat's last theorem collect certain puzzling patterns and ask for a general explanation, the drive to solve problems is a drive to render mathematics more meaningful, to deepen the intelligibility of mathematics. Another way to put my point is that this, intelligibility is a value. We prize existence to the extent that we find it meaningful and thus intelligible. When something occurs, we want to understand why, and we trust that existence includes the reasons and causes that explain occurrences. The same holds for that part of existence we call mathematics. The deductive forms of logic and certain kinds of algorithms play an important role in our investigation of the intelligibility of things, but they do not exhaust that search. There are other kinds of systematicity and connectedness in mathematics, specific to various subject matters which are not captured by the idiom of predicate logic. Predicate logic is limited by the fact that it is a logic of propositions, not a logic of terms, by its inability to capture the contrastive features in reasoning, and by the related paradoxes of material implication, which signal its inability to register certain kinds of relevance and asymmetry that we require in good explanations. And this is true even when predicate logic is augmented by set theory. Moreover, the relations between predicate logic and set theory are themselves problematic and worthy of philosophical investigation. I begin with the example of counting numbers to which most human cultures come sooner or later. Given the simple way in which they are generated, adding a unit to the unit, and then adding another unit to the sum of the unit, and the unit, and then adding another unit, etc., the counting numbers seem to arrive at their meaning with their meaningfulness in full display. However, early on in human history and in the education of small children, the counting numbers lead to patterns that seem mysterious. The natural numbers, for example, can be divided into odd and even numbers. It's easy to present, for example, the odd numbers to find the next one on the list and to give a general rule that captures all of them. But n can also be divided into prime and non-prime numbers. It's not easy to present this list by finding the next and the next and the next one, and it's impossible to give a general rule describing all of the prime numbers. This difference stems from the difference between the trivial additive just the decomposition of the natural numbers and the highly non-trivial trivial, multiplicative decomposition of the natural numbers. Many important results in number theory come from playing the additive and the multiplicative decompositions off against each other. In the historical development of number theory, however, insight is not arrived at merely by combining what is, quote, already there, like facts of addition and multiplication. Going beyond the natural numbers, n. <coughs> By the way, when you invoke n, you're really not entitled to zero. In the variety of ways in which one can go beyond n is the only way to discover why the odd patterns evident in n emerge to understand the deeper reasons for them. This process leads to novel investigations of the fine structures inherent in n which are not discoverable until mathematicians have brought some of those external structures to bear on them. It also changes the meaning of basic notions like number, prime, and unit. 
This going beyond includes bringing n into relation with geometry, with the integers, z, the rationals, q, the reals, r, and the complex numbers, c, and let's not forget the algebraic completion of the rationals. But the various algebraic number fields like q with uh, i adjoined or q with square root of 2 adjoined, as well as other cyclotomic fields and other quadratic fields, with various p-adic fields or with the complex plane as the staging ground for complex analysis or as a conduit to topological settings. So here's my first example. No matter which way you look at it, a number is not a shape. Numbers acquire new meaning by being brought into relation with things that are not numbers. Look as long as you want at the piano postulates. You will not find a triangle or a circle there. Nor, for that matter, will you find a vector space, and nor of a piatic field, a zeta function, a reciprocity theorem, a group of matrices, the complex plane, or a modular form. Nonetheless, in chapter 3, uh, of a mathematical introduction to logic, we find Herbert Enderton presenting the language of number theory, which includes the universal quantifier to mean all natural numbers. Zero for zero, zero for zero, you're not really entitled to that. The successor function s, which means add one to n, the sign for less than, and the signs for addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. He remarks, by number theory, we mean the theory of this structure. These definitions and axioms put important constraints on what might count as the integers, and perhaps the theory of the structure is classroom arithmetic, but it is not number theory. And if it is classroom arithmetic, it's the kind we often offer to our children in primary school, arithmetic riddled with inexplicable mysteries. Why can we so easily find integral solutions for x squared minus y squared equals c squared, but none at all for x squared minus y squared? Mm. Right? Mm. Mm. Cube. No, no, cube. Mm -hmm. But not at all for x cubed minus y cubed. I think I meant plus. No, it's not. If we are limited to the, because that's the first example I discussed. If we're limited to the language and concepts of piano arithmetic, we will never be able to explain. In order for explanatory problem reduction to come about in the first place, the relevance of one number system to another, of abstract structures, of disparate areas of research must be argued for, and clusters of concepts must be developed, with their attendant contrast classes and suites of relations. Reviewing Peter Lipton's insights into inference with best explanation, Amanda Hicks notes that we need to articulate the ways in which we choose hypotheses to explain notable but puzzling facts. She examines the way astronomers in the late 19th century sought to explain anomalies <coughs> in the orbit of Uranus. She cites specific background knowledge that led astronomers to regard the orbit of Uranus as anomalous in the first place, enumerates constraints on the kinds of hypotheses that could be taken seriously at the time, and looks at the way scientists integrate concepts into coherent clusters. A simple example of such reasoning is to be found in Aristotle's syllogistic logic, which requires the discovery of the middle term to bring the minor term and the major term into relation. But real science, like real mathematics, involves, in addition, much more complex methods for aggregating concepts. Concepts that form clusters put strong constraints on each other, narrowing the field of possible explanations and also opening up further avenues of research by analogy. Because predicate logic is a logic of propositions rather than like Aristotle's statistic logic of terms, this aspect of logical reasoning has not been given, or formalizable reasoning, I might say, has not been given enough attention. In the 17th century, Fermat noted that there were many positive integral solutions to the equation x squared plus y squared equals z squared, but none can be found for the equations x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed or x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z to the fourth, etc. How did he see this pattern in the first place? And why did he find it puzzling and in need of explanation? One important bit of background knowledge that sets the stage for this perception is the Pythagorean theorem. 
This result from classical antiquity associates numbers with a certain geometrical figure, right triangle, in a deep and illuminating way. For each right triangle, the square of the length of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the lengths of the two legs. Examples of triplets of positive whole numbers that in this case satisfy both the constraints of arithmetic and the constraints of geometry were known to the Pythagoreans, 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, 8, 15, 17, even 119, 120, 169. However, Fermat noted both <coughs> the existence of these triplet solutions and their absence in the case of analogous equations with exponents of higher degree than 2. Why did he notice this absence? Why did he perceive this absence as anomalous or puzzling? Why hadn't this pattern bothered anybody else before? One answer to these questions, <laughs> since there's all these historians here, I'm waiting for somebody to say, ah, but they, they did <laughs> earlier. Uh, one answer to these questions is that Fermat, like Descartes, used the notation of algebra, where variables represent suites of numbers in one sense, indeterminate numbers in another sense, and constants represent distinguished determinate numbers playing different perceptual roles, and equations replace proportions. Thus, he could consider an expression like x squared plus y squared equals z squared and ask what might happen if one replaced 2 with another integer. The polynomial itself becomes a conceptual display and an object of mathematical investigation. Descartes discovered an analogous puzzle, in this case it <coughs> curves rather than numbers, apropos of Pappas' problem. After he finished solving the problem for the conic sections, that is, for curves associated with quadratic equations and variables, he posed the problem hypothetically for cubic equations and analogous equations of higher degree. Like Fermat, he was puzzled by the difficulty of a twin solution and discerning a taxonomy even for cubic curves. curves. And like Fermat, he boasted unrealistically that nonetheless his methods would lead straightway to the solution sought. One reason why the background knowledge of Fermat and Descartes led them to perceive these facts, there seemed to be no solutions to the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n when n is equal to 3 or 4 or 5 or higher. And, in the case of Descartes, it's very hard to identify and classify all the cubic curves and even harder to identify and classify the higher algebraic curves of n degree as puzzling is that they understood them against the background of arithmetic, that is, in light of the method of mathematical induction. That method, as we all know, shows that if you can prove a claim by involving n for the first case 1, and then prove that if the case involving n holds the case n plus 1 must hold, then you have proved your claim for every n. But this method only works when n indexes the cases in a certain way, and when the relation between case n and case n plus 1 is a certain kind of relation. Once arithmetic has been allied with geometry in the way that algebra facilitates, indexing by n becomes really problematic. Increasing the dimension of Euclidean space increases the complexity of that space and the items in it and their mutual relation in a way that is serious if not dire. Thus it seemed to Fermat that if x squared plus y squared equals z squared had lots of positive integral solutions. x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed should have them too. But it didn't. Background knowledge of arithmetic and the yoking of arithmetic and geometry by the new algebra led this fact to show up as anomalous, as a rupture in the intelligibility of mathematics, as requiring an explanation. An explanation of this puzzling fact could not be pursued by mere induction, that is, by computing more examples of triplets, or by looking harder for examples of those missing triplets. The explanation lay in three insights, some of which Fermat had, others, but really these insights were only well articulated in the 19th century. The first is that the natural numbers can be better understood if they are embedded in other number systems that are larger and have different kinds of systematic features. The second is that the natural numbers have a fine structure, or rather a repertoire of fine structures, which only becomes apparent in light of these embeddings. 
The third 20th century insight is that there are deep correlations between the repertoire of fine structures and the greater embeddings. As I go through these three, I will endeavor, endeavor to exhibit the novel concept clusters and show how they arise from the exploitation of structural ambiguities, which bring together ideas that formerly did not interact at all in the service of problem solving, not mere proof, but cogent and systematic explanation. In order for these insights to be developed, new concepts had to be articulated with the creation of novel clusters of concepts. Before we go to the 19th century, however, I should note a few important developments between Fermat and Gauss. In the 17th century, the natural numbers took on a new meaning when they were viewed as solutions to polynomial equations. The advent of polynomial equations made visible the distinctions among rational, algebraic, and transcendental numbers and then to the dawning realization that many important curves 